Um, it's the uh, last presentation for, the vis for this week, so it's okay for it to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it will be about, uh, about international uh, human rights courts and uh, what do they mean for rule of law. It's the fancy building of the European Court of Human Rights, just next building to the Palais des Droits de l'Homme in, 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 in Strasbourg, where Khadija Ismailova recorded that message mm. to Georgi and to all of us. So it's stand, it stands next to the Council of Europe. It's part of the Council of Europe. It uh, functions as the principal judicial body of the Council of Europe, and it uh, has jurisdiction over 47 countries of, of Europe. That means all European uh, countries, even countries which are not geographically in Europe, but which are definitely part of European family, like Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, with the only exception of Belarus. And uh, that it also actually means that uh, it's, all, it's all the no death penalty area. The only country that has death penalty in Europe is Belarus, uh, not being a member of the, of the Council of Europe and of the European Convention on Human Rights. It has very fancy promise. It actually was built by Norman Foster, and the idea is it's a ship. A ship, uh, with a, uh, ship and which is transparent inside. Like it, it, it moves along, it carries these ideals of human rights and justice and rule of law. And it has really high expectations. When uh, countries uh, of the former Soviet Union joined, Russia joined in 1998, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia uh, joined a little bit later, uh, it had expectations of changing the uh, rule of law situation in these countries uh, drastically. It has not happened. There are a lot of problems with it. There are a lot of achievements. Uh, I would like to tell about this. So the idea is that European Court of Human Rights is the uh, court where you go having exhausted all domestic remedies. So you need to go to first to national authorities. Uh, that uh, means subsidiarity. The European Court of Human Rights is a subsidiary judicial institution. It enters into play after you have failed basically domestically. The idea is that it complements the national judicial authorities. It, uh, it is there for international standard setting. You have the treaty on, which, on the basis of which the court operates, the European Convention on Human Rights. And the court, by considering individual cases coming from 47 member states, applies and interprets this treaty, the European Convention on Human Rights. However, the only uh, jurisdiction that the court has is to declare whether this treaty has been violated or not in a separate case then it's up for the domestic state, up for the individual state domestically to enforce this judgment. And that may include payment of the compensation, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is uh, redress given to the individual applicant through quashing of the in, uh, domestic judicial decisions, like quashing the sentence in a criminal case or reviewing the case. And that's more important thing, uh, taking general measures putting the matters right, uh, providing for legislative or administrative changes in order to prevent the similar violations from occurring once again. And that's actually where the problems start. Uh, as enforcement lies entirely in the hands of the states, it's basically up to them whether they want to enforce it or not. In Azerbaijan or Russia, they will not care about these judgments, unfortunately. In Ukraine, for example, they would, in uh, execution of the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, re reinstate the former justice of the Supreme Court, who was unfairly dismissed from his position during Yanukovych administration. Then, uh, after the positive judgment from Strasbourg, this justice was reinstated in his position, but after the uh, Maidan 2.0. Justice Alexander Volkov in Ukraine. And it was also happened because the proceedings take so long in Strasbourg. Ca average uh, life of the case is seven years. So uh, Alexander Volkov had to wait a little bit. He had to wait also for his case to be considered in Strasbourg, but also for a uh, new president in Ukraine that would, be, uh, that would make situation happen and his reinstatement uh, possible. If it's not for the change of administration in Ukraine, I'm in huge doubt that he would be reinstated in enforcement of the 
decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Then there is a problem with all these unelected European judges to decide in, on issues of uh, national importance. And this is a huge challenge to legitimacy of the court. Uh, there was a judgment against the United Kingdom concerning the voting rights of, a, of the prisoners, where the court said that it's the blanket prohibition on all, on, on, on all convicted prisoners to vote in the United Kingdom is a violation of the right to free elections. The European Court of, uh, the United Kingdom in the Times and in other newspapers, British public said, what's that? <laughs> Who are going to teach us democracy? <laughs> Unelected people from <laughs> Romania and uh, Azerbaijan. <laughs> Uh, the House of Commons decided not to enforce the judgment. And one of the issues was, uh, one of the points for them was lack of direct legitimacy of this court. And this is a problem with many judges. Judges are normally not elected, with the exception of this country, where at the state and uh, local level, some of the judges are elected. It's interesting how the judges of the Supreme Court of California are appointed. We'll talk about it later today. And then important problem is that this court deals with the state responsibility rather than individual responsibility. So it's not international criminal tribunal. And actually, for many state officials, that's fine. All right, probably state is responsible. We violated the convention, but it does not touch them directly. They are not going to jail. Why we still need it? And uh, like I had a lot of my, my own misgivings about whether we really need this court. I think we really need it. First of all, it writes the history. It uh, provides for, for authoritative accounts of what has actually happened in different parts of Europe. Now with Azerbaijan, uh, of course we'll have uh, high level reports from Human Rights Watch. But apart from that, we will have the judgments reached in uh, adversarial proceedings by independent adjudicators who will actually say that there are political prisoners in Azerbaijan, that there is no fair trial in Azerbaijan, etc., etc. This narrative is actually uh, very important, especially for victims in the long run. What's even more important, these judgments show us the drawbacks and show us the problems in domestic legal systems. It, uh, the, the judgments identify the issues that have to be reformed in the future when window of opportunity uh, arrives when we have this possibility. So it provides the roadmap for future reforms. Because frankly, when this window of opportunity is already here, it's too late to think about roadmap. And uh, we've talked about reflection. What can we do when there is no window of opportunity? I think we need to think about roadmaps and start, start writing them. This is one of the tools to start writing them by identifying the pitfalls. And also, uh, the, uh, the, uh, these cases feed and form international law. They provide for the development of public international law. Without all these horrible torture cases from Russia, uh, European Court of Human Rights will not be able to develop its jurisprudence because, frankly, France and UK uh, can't provide these examples of cases. <laughs> uh, and important thing, selfish thing. Uh, it's a huge problem now for lawyers in Azerbaijan, in Russia, who are not in prison, actually to find motivation for their work because they have no courts. When you don't have a court, you actually don't need a lawyer, basically. Probably you need a bribe taken or you need a right person who will call the so-called judge, but you don't, have a, you don't need a lawyer. So the skills are not needed. And it's a huge downturn for legal profession. So this is still the court, because it's independent. No one doubts that. It's still the court. With all these problems, such as length of proceedings and lack of direct legitimacy, but it's still a court you can turn to. You can have these uh, magnificent judges far away in Strasbourg, and that allows skills of the lawyers to flourish, to wait for the window of opportunity that will arrive, that will arrive for other reasons. Thank you.